We're continuing our study today in 1 John chapter 5. Our text is verses 9 through 12. Today's sermon is entitled, Whoever Has the Son Has Life. Well, in verses, beginning in verses 6 through 12, John has outlined really the nature of God the Father's testimony to His Son, Jesus Christ. And he's, he's about to go on to summarize that testimony in order to provide a proper ending to this letter. But before he does that, he pauses to show us why the divine testimony should be believed. And there are two reasons. First, God's testimony is greater than any human testimony. And, and you know, we all tend to accept people, uh, people all tend to accept human testimony, at least at times. And secondly, uh, willful unbelief is sin. Last week in verse 8, John introduced one important legal maxim into his argument, uh, the principle that a point of fact is to be established by a, agreeing testimony of two or three witnesses. Well, here in verses 9 through 12, he introduces another principle, and that is character in a witness. This is obviously an important principle in any system of law, but it was particularly important in the Old Testament era of redemption. The background of this is that the principle took the form of listing types of people who were by reason of their professions uh, or questionable actions in their life that rendered them unqualified to bear a testimony. And so some of the people in these categories, well, you know, obviously thieves, uh, people who uh, were suspected of financial dishonesty, including tax collectors. But they also lumped shepherds in, into this group of people because they seemed to have let their, their sheep graze on other people's land. You know, shepherds were looked down upon. But this principle is illustrated in John 8, 14, where Jesus says, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is, is valid, for I know where I came from and where I'm going. Or earlier, on the basis of the principle requiring two or three witnesses, Jesus said in John 5, 31, that if he should bear witness to himself, his witness would not be acceptable, meaning according you know, to, the, to the standard of, of, of the law. But in John 8, 14, he argues on the basis of the principle of character to say that if the witness of mere men is acceptable, if it's corroborated by others, why shouldn't his testimony be acceptable for, him, for itself alone in that he is much more than, than a mere man. So in, in 1 John 5, we clearly see that there are two kinds of people in the world, believers and unbelievers. See, the Bible doesn't categorize people in terms of good people and bad people. I mean, that's what we tend to do. The truth is we're all sinners, and in and of ourselves we have no righteousness, and our hearts are desperately wicked. That's why the Bible describes all people in terms of those who have Christ, and those who do not have Christ. And in the context of our verses this morning, those who receive the testimony of men and God according to the scriptures and those who do not receive it. So there's no middle ground. There's no third category. There's no half in and half out. It's all or nothing with Christ. So the, the key word in verses 9 through 12 is the word testimony. It's used six times in just these four verses. The word testimony has legal, a legal courtroom meaning. You know, it, it carries the idea of witness, a witness appearing before a judge and presenting evidence in a trial concerning the facts of a case. Therefore, the imagery here in really in, in every conversion of, of God's elect, every one of the conversions is that there's this testimony that's been brought into the courtroom of our mind and our heart. And it's a testimony of the truth concerning the gospel. This is a dual testimony, a testimony of men and a testimony of God that brings the gospel home to the heart. When that happens, then the only response will be saving faith. So let's ask the Lord's blessing before we read His Word. Father, as we can consider Your Word uh, to testimony today concerning uh, Your Word from this text, will You illuminate our minds by the Holy Spirit and give us receptive hearts, and then transform us by the truth of Your Word for Your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 John 5, verses 9 through 12. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that He has borne concerning His Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning His Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us, eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Amen. May God write the eternal truths of His Word upon your heart and mine. 
Well, let's walk through this passage, very gospel centered passage. In verse 9, beginning, and at the beginning of verse 10 also, we see those who receive the testimony. This is where authentic saving faith occurs. And just as a reminder from previous sermons in our series, this is a result of the new birth or regeneration. But here we see there's a dual or a twofold testimony that you must receive when you're converted. There's a testimony of men, that's the ex external witness, and then there's the testimony of God, which is the internal witness. The testimony of men can be brought only to the ear and to the mind. It's basically the free offer of the gospel. It's a, it's the verbal proclamation of the gospel. It's articulated by, you know, preachers or evangelists or really any Christian who tells someone else the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you could call that the external call of the gospel. It goes out to every, every man and woman. But then the testimony of God is what actually brings it home to the heart, and that's called the internal call. The internal call is never rejected because of the new birth. So God works through means of the scripture as Holy Spirit takes that truth and applies it to God's elect after regeneration. Now verse 9 begins, if we receive, and that could really be, be said uh, since we receive, the word receive carries with it the idea of welcoming a guest into your home. It's also used in, in John 1, 12. But to all who did receive him, speaking of Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Therefore, saving faith welcomes and receives the testimony of men. I've already told you about the word testimony. It's like a witness that presents evidence uh, of what a person has seen or heard. When he says the testimony of men, there are two ways that you could take this. One way is to take it uh, just as a general statement that, you know, when somebody tells you something and they are credible, that you should believe it. Well, I take it in a deeper way here because I think that testimony of men here refers to those who preach and teach the gospel and who bring a witness for the gospel. In, in a broader sense, and considering the immediate context in our passage, the testimony of men here uh, referring to the Old Testament prophets who came before. They, they said that God would send Messiah. Their testimony has been recorded in 39 books of the Old Testament. Also, the testimony of men includes John, people like John the Baptist, who was, you know, a voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. And the testimony of men includes the apostles as they brought testimony concerning what they had seen and heard directly from Jesus himself. And to substantiate what I just said, if you turn back to 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, John opens his letter with the record of the testimony of men, the apostles and John himself. He says, that which was from the beginning, referring to the living word of God through Jesus Christ. And of course, this word has existed from all eternity. Then John refers to Jesus stepping into time and he says that which we have heard. So John is the last living apostle at this point, and he, and he actually heard the preaching and teaching of Jesus. In fact, John was the last one at the cross. So he heard the last seven words of Christ from the, crucif from the cross before he, he died. Uh, John, John had also accompanied Jesus throughout his three years of earthly ministry. He goes on and he says in verse 1 there, which we have seen with our eyes. So John beheld the one and only perfect life that was lived out before him in the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw the miracles which pointed to Jesus' deity. He, he saw his perfect obedience. He saw his love and compassion. John was an eyewitness of the life of Christ. And then he adds, which we looked upon. Now here it takes it a little further because this means really to gaze upon or to look intently at something with understanding. Then he adds, and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That is to say, Jesus was not just some spirit being. You know, he wasn't just an apparition. No, there was physical bodily contact with the God-man, Jesus Christ. And then in verse 2, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. John says, everything that I observed, everything I heard, everything I touched, I am now testifying to you concerning the word of life. So if we come back to 1 John 5 and notice when John says, if, if we receive the testimony of men, including John's own testimony, you know, in order for anyone to be saved, it begins with the testimony of men because it's now recorded for us in Scripture doesn't happen in an intellectual vacuum, you know, but there's, there's 
There must be another testimony with that, the testimony of God, which is far greater. It's superior because it reaches all the way down to the depth of our soul. And the testimony of God here is the internal witness of Holy Spirit that accompanies the testimony of men. So John's already been talking about it in this context because you'll notice at the end of verse 6 he says, The Spirit is one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. In verses 7 and 8 he talks about the Spirit testifying. Uh, the testimony of God by the Spirit is this inner conviction of sin that reveals that you're separated from God. He reveals to you your desperate need for God's forgiveness and for salvation. It's the inner persuasion of the truthfulness of the message that's being brought to you. God's testimony that goes to the core of your soul and convinces your heart of the, the veracity of this message and that you need it. So as we've said many times throughout our study, saving faith is not an intellectual discipline. And that's not to say that apologetics are unimportant. It's just that you can't possibly argue anyone into the kingdom of God. You can't persuade anyone to make a decision for Christ. Because in our natural state, our will is in utter bondage to sin and Satan. You can't just wake up one morning and decide you're, you're going to believe the Bible. You're going to become a Christian. That's why the scriptures labor this idea of the new birth. And God takes the message of the gospel. He combines that with the internal witness of the Holy Spirit to a new heart. And he convicts of sin. He pre-convinces and persuades a person to believe. So when John says God's testimony is greater... One thing he means is that, well, God cannot lie. The secondly, he means God's testimony accomplish, accomplishes God's purpose because it pierces, it penetrates to the depth of a person's soul. He invades your soul. And he says in verse, verse 9, For this is the testimony of God that He has borne concerning His Son. So God the Father, He is, he is pointing to His beloved Son, and He's doing that in every conversion. <clears throat> and so what we see here is that the heart of the gospel is the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is the Savior, He's the Redeemer, He's the Reconciler. He is the only object of saving faith. He is the accomplisher of salvation through His sinless life and His substitutionary sin-bearing death. Therefore, as God gives us opportunity, you know, as we go out and witness this message in the world, we need to make sure we talk about the person and work of of Jesus Christ. That needs to be the core. But the main idea is Holy Spirit takes the gospel and that's synonymous with the testimony of, of men recorded for us in Scripture and He witnesses the truth of that to a heart that He has regenerated and then the only response after regeneration will be the person will exercise saving faith. So concerning this internal testimony, just a few cross-references. First, First Corinthians 12.3 it says, no one can say, Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Of course, that doesn't mean that this is just, you can mouth the words that Jesus is Lord and you're saved. Because Matthew 7, 21 records Jesus' words there in response to people who merely professed to know Him, yet they didn't know Him. And Jesus will say to them, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God. So just parroting those words doesn't bring into a person, uh, person into the kingdom. For you to say that with reality in your heart, well, the only way you can do that is it's a work of the Holy Spirit. We are utterly dependent upon the Spirit of God to bring testimony to the heart after we bring testimony to the ear and to the mind. So as we come to the first part of verse 10, John says, The one who believes in the Son of God has testimony in himself. Believing in verse 10 is synonymous with receiving. The testimony of men, the testimony of God in verse 9. To believe in Christ means to put your trust in Jesus. He's your only hope of standing before a holy God and relating to Him at any level. And this, this trust also means you're going to make a full commitment of your life to Him. By, that, that, by definition, you submit your life to the Lordship of Christ. Well, because He is Lord. You don't make Him Lord. He is Lord in fact, you surrender to God daily from that point on. And that's what it means to believe, to truly believe. This, is, this isn't mere head, head knowledge. It's also more than just some kind of warm feeling or, or affection. And the word in, in here says, whoever believes in the Son, well, that's best tr translated into. You go all the way into Christ. And therefore, in verse 10, the one who commits their life to Christ has the testimony in himself. Don't you love the, the straightforward manner in which John is just spelling this out? This is not, 
This is not merely, you know, you've heard people talk about, well, believing in some kind of higher power. They talk about it that way sometimes. No, there, there's no way to come to God, the one true God, except through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The second half of verse 10, and this is on the other hand, he points out those who reject this testimony, meaning those who are still spiritually dead. And he says, the one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God is born concerning His Son. This, this shows how serious unbelief is. You know, people often get up in today, especially online, if you, if you watch any of that stuff, it, but they get up and they disparage the Bible. I mean, atheists or ag agnostics, they get up and they say, well, man just made the Bible up, and they make all these suppositions for which they have no basis. They'll say things like creationism is just make-believe, and, and yet they have no answers for where matter came from, uh, let alone how complex, you know, creation is. How could it even exist without intelligent design? They just rail on the scriptures about, you know, how God is some abusive monster and how could God punish anyone for eternity because they don't believe in Jesus. But really what I'm learning is, as I listen to these people, they're railing against the false view of failed universalism that's being pushed out by many Christians today when God has not purposed to save everyone who ever lived. It's not his plan. No, he chose a people for himself. And the scripture deals with all those things. It deals with creation, it deals with election, predestination, his sovereignty. You might not like the answers you get, but they're available to you when you embrace the truth of scripture. It explains all that for you. And we couldn't believe either, unless if God regenerated us. So we need to remember that unbelievers cannot help the fact that they don't believe because they're spiritually dead. But unfortunately for them, that won't get them off the hook. Because John is saying, when you reject God's testimony, His written word, in reality, you're calling God a liar. That's strong language, but John just tells it like it is. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. So all unbelief is not just holding a neutral position. This is a person who is in adamant opposition to God. And they're doing it with inflammatory intent when they re reject God's testimony. This, this is and it's really hard for some of us because, you know, we, we have friends, we have family, people that we love who reject God's testimony. But when a person dies in unbelief, well, that is a damning sin because unbelief keeps them separated from Christ and under God's just judgment. Jesus said in John 3, 18, He says, Whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of of the only Son of God. Then in John 8, 24, he says, Unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Then later in the Upper Room Discourse, in chapter 16, he said, When He comes, he's referring to the Holy Spirit, He will convict the world concerning sin because they do not believe in Me. Another translation could be, Holy Spirit has come to bring prosecution or indictment to the heart that you have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to convince you, persuade you of the truthfulness of the gospel message. And you, need, you have to have that internal witness. Otherwise, in your flesh, the natural man will always reject the truth of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. You see, we are utterly helpless without the work of Holy Spirit. First, we saw then that those who received the testimony, then there are those who rejected it. Now, <clears throat> thirdly, John circles back. He, re he restates the testimony of which he spoke earlier in verses 9 and the first part of verse 10. So point three is the testimony restated. Verse 11, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. Eternal life means the life of the ages to come, literally. It's the, it's, it's the life of eternity. And there's a twofold meaning here. When we think of eternal life, normally we only think in terms of duration, that it never ends. That's not the primary meaning, though. The primary meaning for eternal life is a new quality of life. Eternal life is unlike anything the world can give us or offer to us. But it's definitely not heaven here on earth. I see think some Christians make that mistake and they think that, well, if I put my trust in Jesus, that's going to get me out of all kinds of suffering in this life. And, you know, I don't have to struggle. I can live the victorious life. But that, God doesn't say that. Eternal life is the life of God himself in the soul of a man. And our journey is really God revealing your own flesh to you as you go through struggles so that you can surrender to him in every area of your life. That's really the Christian life. 
Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true living God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is having a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Not, not merely knowing about God, but experientially knowing Him, walking with Him. And what this tells us is that when you are converted, you don't just embrace a religion, you receive a person, a person of God and the person of Jesus Christ. I mean, when you were married, you didn't just receive the institution of marriage, right? You received a person. You came to know a person. That's what eternal life is concerning God. That God is more real to you than anything else in this world. And He lives inside of you and now you walk with Him. And through His Word, through prayer, corporate worship and the, all the means of grace, He guides you and He transforms you for the remainder of your life. But now you have union with God and communion and fellowship with Him. This is a whole new existence. And before you received eternal life, you may not have realized it, but you only had a physical existence because you were a spiritual corpse. You couldn't, you couldn't understand spiritual things. You didn't even know. So eternal life is the life of God coming down from heaven and flooding your soul. It's spiritual life, supernatural life. That's number one. But the secondary meaning of eternal life is the duration of it, that this life is an unending life with God. And, and the us in verse 11 refers only to the, elect, to the elect here. And of course, the fact that He has given it to us means that it's a gift. It's not something that we have earned or could earn. We don't deserve it, but God has freely bestowed it upon us and given us eternal life. He further defines it when He says, and this life is in His Son. So it's clear that there's no life outside of Christ, yet all life is found in union with Him. So John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. So you could put it this way. Eternal life is knowing Christ, following Him, worshiping Him, adoring Christ, obeying Him, serving Him. That's why in Philippians 1, 21, Paul can say, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Why is it gain? Well, I go to be with Him. And so he summarizes this in verse 11. He who has the Son has life. The word has here means to hold, hold fast to something. This is, this is the nature of saving faith. The, the, the matter of fact is that He holds you in the palm of His hand and He never lets you go. The point here is whoever has the Son, whoever possesses the Son. And again, not merely a head knowledge or, of something or... It's, it's not even talking about a person who has morality in their life or a person who's a member of the visible church. No, this is someone in faith union with Jesus Christ. And then John is so black and white after he, he puts it in the positive, he ends with a negative. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Again, all life is found in having the Son. Well, let's end this way. Have you laid hold of the Son? I mean, has there been a time in your life when by God's grace and help you recognized that you were a sinner and you asked God to, to forgive you and save you and you put your trust in Jesus, you committed your life to Him? Have you heard the testimony of men concerning Jesus from the Scriptures and from those who will testify to the Scripture? Has the Holy Spirit brought this home to your own heart and life and persuaded you that Jesus is the only Son of God and the Savior of sinners? Father, thank you for this portion of your word today. And I pray that if someone in the sound of my voice and, and you're, they're listening to this sermon, they don't know you, that you'll, you'll convert them this very moment. That you'll uh, register the truth of your word into their heart and life in a way that, that they will be saved. And so, Lord, we pray that your word will accomplish your purposes in Jesus' name. Amen.